Is that for here or to go? That's a common question in our fast food society. It's asked at the end of many of our orders. Most of us will hear that phrase millions of times by the time uh, we finally go on to be with the Lord. It's that for here or to go? And the next time somebody asks you that simple question there, as they flip your burger, I hope you will mentally flip back to tonight, to Philippians chapter 4. And I've titled this teaching here, Joy to Go, because Philippians, it asks us these very questions to consider this question, which is spiritually speaking, is the life that I'm living, is it for here or is it to go? Is it for earth or is it for heaven? Is it focused on the temporary things or on the eternal? And as I look at how I spend my time, my talents, my treasures, and as you do the same, we would be really wise to occasionally ask that same question again and let it reverberate in our mind. Is this for here or is it to go? The answer to that question will make all the difference in our attitudes, in our action, in our satisfaction in life. And if you've been with us here in this series in Philippians, you know that the whole book can be summed up in those two words, extreme joy. And in Philippians, we find how to have the joy of Jesus in our own life, and of course, not to just let it stop there, but to share it with the rest of the world. And you might say that Paul has given us kind of a spiritual happy meal. You know, that it's just a nice little package here, four chapters that is so packed full of, you know, spiritual calories that we could really gain a lot from it. Now, at the end of the book, I can almost picture Paul with a little paper hat on his head saying, hey, is this for here or to go? Are you going to take these truths with you or are you just going to leave them here at the church? You know, because sometimes we do that. We'll ha hear something here and we go, wow, that was awesome. And later we try to think of it and say, I don't even know what it was or I don't know how to put it into practice. But I hope we can all look at our lives and say, you know what, with Philippians, the truths that are found in there, they're to go in our life. You see, the Christian life, the whole thing, it's not for here, really. It's to go. And if you're a follower of Christ here tonight, you need to know that you're headed toward heaven. Sometimes just remembering the most basic of things really can do so much for our lives. And the joy that Paul experienced and that God promised throughout his word, it's really not always so focused on here. It doesn't have so much to do with what we have here or what we experience here it is where we are going to go when all this is over see if Paul was living his life for here well he would have had plenty of problems to worry about and complain about he was in prison you may remember awaiting possible execution and you see Paul didn't live for here he lived his whole life to go and that's how Paul brought the joy of Jesus into his own life on a continual basis. And not just in his own life, but he was able to share it. And so we see there in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Now, anytime you see the word therefore, it points to what came before. And let's just back up a couple verses and remind ourselves the context here. Philippians 3.20 it says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Again, reminding us that we're really not for here. We're to go. We're getting ready to go. From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to talk about what we have in store for us. So again, I remind you in that simple little phrase, I hope will burn into your brain and you'll find yourself at uh, restaurants and snapping back and having a deja vu moment there, that our life is not for here. It's to go. And, and the real home that we have is in heaven and if we try to find our home here we're not going to find it and we'll soon be there and we eagerly wait it says to be with God now what is exactly does that mean practically what does it mean tomorrow if the Lord doesn't come tonight what does it mean tomorrow as we face tomorrow well verse 1 tells us therefore because of this hope because of this truth it means we can stand fast here see that's what he says we can keep going through life with the proper priorities even when it's hard and living our lives to go, this is what it means, first of all. The very first thought here is that it means we can give first priority to the things that will last. The first priority to the things that will last. And it kind of goes without saying that, that the first priority in our lives would be Jesus. And certainly Paul put his priority there on his relationship with Jesus. Not just in his talk, but in his walk. He really did 
put Jesus first, first, but it's worth noting, I think, that Paul was also a person who put a great priority on people. Paul was passionate about people. See, often you hear it. Maybe you've even thought it. Oh, I love Jesus. I, it's just people I can't stand. You know, I just don't like his followers, you know. I like him. I like Christ. I just can't stand Christians, you know, or whatever else, or non-Christians. Those are the two type of people I don't like, Christian and non-Christian. You know, I can't stand either of them. But I really love Jesus, you know. And, and Paul here, he would never have said such a thing. Why? Because, see, it's, it's really hard to imagine a more personal sentence than verse 1. Notice he calls his friends in Philippi their beloved twice in the same verse. Now, Paul was never at a loss for words, but he uses the same word twice. He says, beloved, my longed for, my family, my joy, my crown, beloved. You know, at the beginning and the end of the sentence. In other words, hey, you guys are so valuable, i got to say it twice. You're my eternal investment. You are loved my priority that was his priority paul's priority people why because he loved god and god loves people and living your life to go means putting the first things first of course and first priority on the things that will last because so often we let the things that won't last take first priority and we just don't have time for all the things that really matter most the things that can you can take with you after you die is what you should be living for and if you haven't heard well Oftentimes people will say, well, you can't take it with you. And that's true. In most cases, you can't take it with you. It reminds me of the story of a multimillionaire who wanted to be buried with all of his wealth, just in case he could take it with him. You know, and even if he couldn't take it with him, he didn't want anyone else taking it with them. You know, if I can't have it, nobody else gets it. And so that was in his will, very clearly stated that he was to be buried with all of his riches in the coffin next to him. So you know what his wife did? At the funeral, she wrote her dead husband a $4 million check and stuffed it in his coat pocket there. Well, needless to say, he couldn't cash it, right? But she did fulfill the will there. She gave him the money just like he wanted. And many people, if you look at their priorities, if you think about it, it's clear that they love things and use people. That's really the end of the story for them. They love things, they use people. But Jesus taught us just the opposite, to love people and use things. And so just a quick spiritual inventory, thinking on that question, am I living for here or to go? Well, look at the things that you love. What are the things that you put the priority on? Are they things that you have while you're here or things that you can take with you when you go? It doesn't mean you can't have nice things here and enjoy those things, but we need to keep those things in their proper place and perspective. If it's cash or it's check or any material thing, really, you can't take it with you. You'll never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You know, it just doesn't happen that way. And the truth is that there is a way that you can take it with you depending on what it is. See, the only two things you can take with you are really found right here. These are the things that you can take to go in life. Your relationship with God, that goes with you after you die. And your relationship with God's people, that goes with you after you die too. So you better start loving them now because you're going to be with them for all eternity. So your eternal investments, that's what it's all about here. Your real valuables. It comes back to the question in your life, are you living your life for here or to go? And like any investment, it takes time and energy and effort to invest in those things. It's not easy to keep the right priorities. And anytime you have people, you have people problems. And Paul certainly knew that. He was no stranger to that. So we see it in verse 2. It says, I implore you, odious, odious, odia, and I implore Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, and Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, here's the second thought that I want to share with you, which is if you want to live your life to go, if you really do, if you say, I, that's what I want, well, what we need to learn to do is be a fisher, not a fighter. Now, you might be asking, what do you mean by that? You mean like, that's what I should do, quit my job and go fish. I've always wanted somebody to tell me that, and now you're saying it from the pulpit, it has the ring of truth. No, apparently what we're seeing here is that people who were not fishing, not being fishers of men, they were fighters. They were fighting amongst each other. Apparently there was some friction in the fellowship there in Philippi. Two ladies that were in leadership, and they were fussing and fighting. Now, we don't know what they were fighting about, but we know from verse 3 that it wasn't always this way, that there had been a time in their life where instead of fighting with each other, they had been fighting for something. They'd been fighting for a common goal, which was the gospel. That was the thing that had mattered most to them, and nothing else really mattered that much. 
But somewhere along the line, this is what happened. They began to fight each other rather than to fight for the faith. They began to disagree. They began to divide. And Paul is here imploring. That means he was begging. He's begging them to answer the question in their own personal relationship here. Is this for here or to go? You know, is this something that really is going to expand the gospel or is it going to contract the gospel? See, the, the letter wasn't written just for the Philippians. It was written for us too. Because... One of the things I've found in life is that it's really easy to get caught up in some of the family fights, you know, that go on in even the church world. And that's what you see happening here is Philippi was a great church. And yet at the same time, that doesn't mean it was without people problems, because if you got people, you got people problems. And so if there's someone either here or somewhere else that you're fighting with, an ex-something, a former friend, a family member, a something, a someone out there. You know who you're thinking of right now. You know, we don't, but you do. It's a good question to ask yourself, is this fight that I'm having with them, this friction that's there, is it for here or, or is it to go? In other words, is this difference that we're having here, this difference of opinion or attitude, is it going to matter one way or another after one or both of us are gone? Are we going to continue this debate in heaven? You know, we get there and, all right, now we got all eternity to work this one out. Are we going to let a disagreement here keep us from sharing the joy of Jesus with the world and experiencing it in our own life? See, another Paul, not the Apostle Paul, but uh, the Beatle Paul, put it, well, life is very short, and there's no time for fussing and fighting, my friends. We can work it out. Now, unfortunately, they sang that song right before they broke up. But you see that it's not all you need is love like that. We need something a little bit more. And Jesus can do something that nobody else can in our life, which is get us to understand, hey, most things really don't matter. And the practical solution to keeping relationships on the right road, I think it's right here. Remember the greater goal of the gospel. That's what Paul appealed to. He said, remember, guys, we're really supposed to be about fishing, not fighting. Have the same mind. He was telling them, lose your mind, lose your perspective, lose your priorities, and get back to the right priority, which is the mind of Christ. Live your life to go and let things go that are not going to matter in eternity. And when we live our lives for here, everything seems to just take on incredible importance. You know, I, I think of how many times... Uh, early in our lives, especially before we knew the Lord, my wife and I would fight about the dumbest things. I mean, I would be right, she would be wrong, and it was just something very minor. And, and yet, we couldn't seem to get past it. She couldn't seem to let it go, you know. But, but one of the things you see now is that, you know, not much matters. Sorry, honey. Now, the reason, again, I want to give that picture to you in your mind, which is, uh, let's say a group of fishermen, you know, they went on their little annual trip. And Many people do this, but in the past, they'd always had a great, wonderful time, right? But this time, one year, problems with the boat. You know, the boat wouldn't float, and they had to go there and stay on the shore. And they st staying in this little bitty lodge and everything else. Well, what do you think is going to happen in there? Well, it would be the worst trip ever. No fishing, just fussing and fighting. Why? Because when those who are called to fish, when those who live to fish can't fish or don't fish, they fight. Now, what's the point of that little simple parable? It's this. Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, follow me, and you will fish. That's what your life will be about. You'll be thinking, how can I reach people? How can I bridge gaps? How can I get and, and reach out to people? Not how can I get to people so I can prove that I'm right and they're wrong, but how can I show and share the love and joy of Jesus with somebody else? How can I do that? Building bridges like Jesus did. Well, that's what fishing's all about. You'll make eternal investments in people. Your, your Christianity will be catching. And so if you think about that, Jesus was telling them and us, as he's calling them to be fishers, that the Christian life is not for here, it's to go. It's to go into all the world and make disciples. And how is that? Well, again, it's not going to be by fussing and fighting, my friends, so often. But soon we'll find out that those who are called to fish, if they don't fish, they end up fighting. That's what ends up happening. So much of the church world is fighting about questions that nobody's asking. Nobody cares out there in the world, and they're all, we're all messed up on that. And meanwhile, the gospel doesn't spread. And I thank God for a pastor, a friend, a leader here in Pastor Pedro who has kept the main thing the main thing and knows what matters and what doesn't. And he doesn't 
led us or lead us toward fussing and fighting about the dumb things. And so you see in life so many fractured families, so many fractured fellowships, so many places where there's friction between friends, and that's exactly what happened in Philippi. And here's the thing. If we can't get along with each other as Christians, how can we ever reach others for Christ? How would they ever look and see the love that we have for one another if we don't have it? So Paul asked these fighting Philippians here, hey, is that issue for here or to go? And if it's not to go, if it's not going to matter in eternity, it's got to go. And so he says to them, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord's at hand. Now this is the third, and we'll spend the rest of the teaching kind of elaborating on this little point here, which is that there in verse 4 and 5, Paul says a word that he said over and over in here, which is rejoice. And he says, you know what? I'm saying it again. Rejoice. I'm going to say it one more time. Rejoice. In the Lord always. Why does he say it that way? Well, because he wants us to make the choice to rejoice and to show that he is doing it. And it is a choice. It's not automatic. It's not something that uh, you have a default that you're just going to rejoice in everything. He says, you've got to learn to do this. And he goes on for the rest of the chapter to show how he is personally learning it and how he can share that with us. And so we have a reason to rejoice in the Lord no matter what is happening in the world. See, that's the thing. If you rejoice in the circumstances, you might not have any reason to rejoice tonight. But if you have, you're rejoicing in the Lord, you always have a reason to rejoice. And so that's why he says it here. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. See, once you make that choice to rejoice, there's other choices that will follow out of that. And one of them here is talking about gentleness. You know, you can't have a lot of joy in your life if you don't experience and decide to be a gentle person. See, if life were always nice and never difficult and there were never any circumstances that would challenge this, we wouldn't need to be told it because it would just be easy and obvious for everybody. But gentleness is a willing to let things go, to just say, you know what? I've been wrong, but that's okay. Uh, it's, I'm just going to let that go because it's not going to matter when time passes. And so this set of verses here shows us that the quality of our relationships with people are a direct outgrowth and a, a direct reflection of our relationship with God. He's saying, you know, if you can rejoice in the Lord, then you're going to find yourself able to be gentle with people. See, if you're not thankful to the Lord, you're pretty soon going to get very, very bitter and very uh, hostile towards people. And living our lives to go means living like the Lord is at hand, like he could come at any time. That's exactly what he says here. He says, be gentle, man, because the Lord is at hand. Jesus is near to us now spiritually, that's true, but he also is coming back for us soon physically. And it's a good question to consider for a moment, which is how would I act? Would I act differently? Would I talk differently if I knew that the Lord was at hand, that I knew that my conversation might actually get interrupted by him? Imagine yourself like driving, you know, along the, the palmetto there or whatever, and your gentleness uh, is not evident to all at that moment. And so there I am yelling, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I got the window rolled down, and I'm in heaven, but I don't realize it yet. What the hallelujah? Wow, hi, Jesus. You know, I was just honking the horn. You know, honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Hey, let your gentleness be known to all because he's about to come back and because I'm about to go. See, even if he doesn't come during my lifetime for everybody, he's definitely coming during my lifetime for me. Have you ever thought about that one? Jesus is coming during your lifetime. I guarantee you. At some point, you're going to go to him if he doesn't come first. And so, verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, this is definitely one of those sections of Scripture that you should have highlighted, that you should have circled, you should have starred in whatever way. Uh, so I'll take just a moment for you to do that. And then... What we're going to do is talk about it for a moment because the word of God is not just for here, it's to go. See, I mean, we could all circle it, we could all star it and everything else, but if we forget when the moment that we need it, uh, well, it's not going to help much. See, God's word isn't just for here at church. It is that, but the whole idea of it is that we would soak it in here so that we can let it out there. And if we're to take these truths to go, 
as we go to work, as we go to our homes, as we go through our daily struggles. One of the things that I found is it helps to get certain scriptures, especially these kind of scriptures, that I know where to find them, that I know where to get them when I need them. Philippians 4, 6, it makes a great memory verse if you struggle with worry and anxiety, all right? Philippians 4, 6. Now, some of you right now are worried and anxious that you won't be able to memorize it. You know, that's what you're thinking. Ah, ah, see, that just makes me anxious just thinking about this. But here's the thing. This might help. When in a fix, Philippians 4, 6. Some of you have heard me say that before, but when in a fix, Philippians 4, 6. See, because we come here and there's all kinds of peace, extreme joy. Hey, pretty easy on a Wednesday night surrounded by Christians. But wow, out there, taking it to go, how am I going to do that? Well, we have to have these things in our mind, a part of our lives. And when in a fix, which it won't take you long to get in one, if you're not already, Philippians 4, 6. A nine-word summary of that for you, if you want to memorize it this way. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Give thanks always. Nine words. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Give thanks always. And, and what he's saying here is that nothing will take your joy away like worry. Worry is just deadly to joy. It's the greatest thief in the world. It's like a rocking chair, you know? Lots of motion, but no forward progress. It's just back and forth, back and forth, worried about something. It reminds me of a farmer who was named Joe, Farmer Joe. He was well known in the town in which he lived for being the town worrier. When it was the dry season, Joe was worried about the drought. When it was the rainy season, well, Joe was worried about flooding. And when it was hot, he worried about just the drying up of everything. When it was cold, he knew that everything was going to freeze. His crops were going to have problems. So before the crops began to grow, he worried, man, the harvest is going to be so small, I'll have nothing to sell. But then he had a great year, and he worried because he said, nah, my truck isn't going to be big enough. You know, my, no matter what I do, I can't seem to get it right. Now, one day, Joe came into the little country store in the town where he lived, and he had a huge smile on his face, just seemed to be whistling a tune and everything, and the clerk who'd known him all his life said, hey, Joe, why aren't you worried, man? You don't seem to have your usual burden, and Joe said, no, I don't worry anymore. I, I actually hired somebody to worry for me. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, he does all the worrying I used to do, and the man behind the counter there said, man, that's, that's a lot of work to worry like that. How much are you paying him? Joe said, well, it's kind of expensive. Um, I'm paying him $10,000 a week. The clerk said, $10,000 a week? Where are you going to get that kind of money? And Joe said, well, that's for him to worry about. <laughs> now, in a sense, when we live our lives to go, that's exactly what we've got, is we have someone to worry for us, which is Jesus. You know, where you say, hey, Jesus, your word says, 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Which means, you know what? He's told us. Go ahead and throw your worries on my back. I'll worry for you. The great thing is he doesn't charge us $10,000 a week. He doesn't charge us anything to carry our cares. In fact, he's just commanded us to do it. And we don't do it at our own loss. And so living our lives to go means we don't have to be so anxious about everything. Again, it doesn't mean we're irresponsible. But it means, you know, here on earth, we do have a lot to worry about. I mean, if you look around, if you care, if you pay attention, there's a lot to worry about. You know, our, our health, our finances, our kids, our cars, our houses, all of these things. But the Bible says, you know what, if those are your treasure, if that's where your heart is, the whole problem with that is that that stuff is so fragile, you should be worried. I mean, if that's what you put your hope on, if that's what you've tied your joy to and all of that in life well you should be worried but see oftentimes the worries of this life they cause us to miss out on the very adventure that god has for us to live this life because you know he said yeah you're when you start knowing that you're going to go you can actually enjoy here a whole lot more it's a funny and bizarre principle but i know this much when i worked at exxon and i thought it was my whole life i mean it was my whole career and i just thought this matters so much i didn't know the lord and and my job was my god and i just wanted all the things that it would bring and all that kind of stuff every little thing mattered so much i'd freak out i'd be in a meeting i'd say something stupid and the whole week i'd be like lynn knows i'd come home and i'd just be oh, i can't believe i said that's gonna kill my career you know i just always everything mattered so much 
And then I came to know the Lord and I was like, you know what? I'm going to just do my job as if I, I could be there forever or as I might go. You know, I don't know what. It doesn't matter. It's not my God anymore. It matters because I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. And the thing is, this is what's amazing. My, my performance at, at work actually improved, but my enjoyment of work in, improved because all of a sudden I realized at the end of the day, it, it don't matter. In, in heaven, I'm not going to be, oh, I can't believe I said that stupid thing in the meeting. It's not going to be what I'm thinking about. And so living our lives to go, it's going to improve our experience here most of the time. And so, so many of us live with that fear of the risk. You know, better play it safe. The riskiest move, though, is to live for here. Why? Because it is definitely going to be lost. There is absolutely no safe investment. You know, I've had several people, because I have a financial background, ask me, what can I do to be safe right now? I said, well, um, uh, what? I don't know. <laughs> Let me know if you find something because it's kind of like the riskiest thing is to have your whole life tied up in here. This world is passing away. The safest investment is living your life to go. Not irresponsible. Again, that's not what I'm talking about. But the good question right now is, is my life being lived for here to go? If it were all to go tomorrow, you know, all of the stuff that I have, would I still have investment in heaven and eternal things? See, there was a time when I was deciding whether to leave the security of my corporate job there and go into full-time ministry. And that's not a decision that God calls everybody to make, but he was calling me to make it, that's for sure. And we had a coupon for a free weekend stay. Len remembers this. There's a lot of funny things about it. But it was at a hotel there. And, and we decided to use it to get away and, and just pray and spend some time with the Lord. Now, deep down, I knew God was calling me to make the move. I did. I, I knew, I'd known it for a long time. But the thing was, I was a worrier and still am to a large ex extent. And so I was worried. I was anxious. How will I support my family? You know, what, what will we eat? What will we wear? That kind of stuff, you know. And we got into the hotel room only to find Gideon's Bible there. And, and it's usually closed in the drawer. If you've ever been to the hotels, you know they're there in the drawer of the Bible. But this one was open on the desk. That was weird enough just by itself. Now, Matthew 6 was open there. And this is what it says. God has a sense of humor. Let me read it for you. Matthew 6. Do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? <laughs> For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now sufficient also for the day was the trouble of that hotel because we got what we paid for and we didn't even stay the whole night. Because uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't, we, we went only to hear this verse apparently and then it was time to go, but... But, but worry is not, not just a waste. This is what it says here. It's a sin. And, and right away, if you're anything like me, you're worried now that you've got the sin of worry. You know, oh no. But, but here's the thing. It is a sin. Why? Because it, it, the great thing about that is it can be forgiven and it can be healed, just like all sins. You know, if you want to live your life to go, you can turn your cares into prayers. That's what Philippians 4, 6 says. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Give thanks always, and this is what will happen. Verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your heart and mind. Now, some of us are desperately seeking the peace that comes from understanding. If I could just understand this, then I'd have peace. That's not what the Bible promises. See, physically here, there are a lot of things that will disturb your peace. This is not a very peaceful place, you know, physically, the world. And there are a lot of things that do disturb us. Now, many years ago, uh, when we had the real young kids, you know. That was when Toy Story first came out. I don't know if you guys remember that, but our, someone gave our kids, if, if you're here tonight and you gave them this, I can't remember who gave it, gave it to them, but I've forgiven you. But, but the kids <laughs> got, a, uh, but got a Buzz Lightyear piggy bank, you know, a Buzz Lightyear piggy bank. And when you put in the coin there, uh, some really loud music, and it had no volume knob. It's just really loud music would play, you know, blah, 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 and all this stuff. And then Buzz would salute and yell, to infinity and beyond. And he'd say, you know, I'm Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace and all this stuff. Now, one night all the kids were sick, you know, and, 
and fevers going on and waking up and they were having nightmares and, and yelling in the night and everything else. And just, Lynn and I alternated going into the room. You know, if, you, if you've ever had young kids, you know that thing where it's your turn, isn't it? You know, that kind of stuff. And, and I, well, on my turn, one time I just finally said, I, I'm just, I'm just going to fall asleep here on the floor. You know, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to fall asleep on the floor of the kids. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I know what time it was because I saw the clock, I was awakened by the blast of the trumpet. Now, I thought it was Jesus coming back. <laughs> and this familiar phrase here, I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. I come in peace. And, and he was just saluting like crazy. He was like stuck in a loop. I come in peace. I come in peace, you know. And, and the kids are starting to stir and everything. They're finally asleep, you know, for the first time in the night. They're finally asleep. And so I'm running down the hall with Buzz Lightyear trying to get rid of him. And I don't remember exactly what I did in the middle of the night, but I know he went to infinity and beyond at that point. And so it turns out that there was a coin stuck in the little slot, you know, and it picked 3 o'clock in the morning to short out. So if you don't believe in... in in spiritual warfare, listen, you know, I think some little demon messed with that thing. But life has a lot more serious disruptions, of course, than just that, than just a piggy bank gone wild, you know? There are a lot of things that we'll never understand this side of heaven. But when we live our lives to go, we can have a peace that passes understanding right here. See, the, the peace that comes from understanding, that one can go. As soon as I don't understand, there goes my peace. But the peace that passes understanding, that one's going to stay. And it's going to stay all the way into eternity when I'll finally understand. And then it won't matter anyway. Now, in that, verse 7 here says that God will guard our minds. That word is a military word, which means he's going to keep a military guard on our life. In other words, saying at, the, at our brain, you know what? That's a wrong feeling. That one's going to go. Wrong thinking. That one's got to go. And God expects us to cooperate with this. Sometimes we wonder why we have so much troubled thoughts well maybe verse 8 is one we should think on for a moment finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report if there's any virtue and if anything is praiseworthy meditate on these things and in other words think on these things and we are a very anxious society lots of you know, solutions are offered these days, and most of them in the form of some solution, you know, a, a pill or an a, a injection or something. Take this, do this, try that, that sort of thing. And the ultimate anti-anxiety cure is not necessarily medication, but meditation. Now, I'm not here telling you to stop your medication. You know, don't get me wrong here. You know, I don't want to be responsible for that. But I do want you to think about what it's saying here. Meditate. Now, this is a word, because of the world that we live in today, that people might come to the wrong conclusions on. What does meditate mean? Well, it doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean sitting cross-legged, you know, contemplating the sound of one hand clapping. Um, you know, that sort of thing. No, that, that has nothing to do with biblical meditation. What is biblical meditation? The word literally meant to chew something through, to, to chew on it, to think it through, to... Uh, mull it over, over and over again, to, to put a truth into your life and, and think on it and say, Man, what does that mean? You know, if, if God says to rejoice in the Lord, what does that mean today for me? What is that going to mean? See, it's not emptying your mind of all thought, which is what n New Age type of meditation is all about. Empty your mind. You know, my mind's empty enough. It doesn't need to be empty. <laughs> Fill your mind. See, that's what the Bible says. Fill your mind with Philippians and the words of God. Fill it up. You know, an empty mind is a really scary thing. So take God's word to go. Chew it through throughout the day. You know, sometimes people think their devotional has to be 42 chapters. You know, sometimes it's better to just take one verse and chew it well, you know, and get, get it really ingested and thought through so that you can do something with it, and it'll keep you in perfect peace. God will keep in perfect peace, Isaiah 26, 3 says, those whose mind is steadfast on him, those who are meditating on the true things that come from God. And again, these thoughts that we share here, they're not just for here, they're to go. They're to go home with us. They're to go to work with us. And the thing is, they may not let you take your Bible to work, but they can't keep you from taking your Bible to work in your head. You can think on those things. 
Not to be left here and never thought about again. When we were really young, you know, one of our kids turned to the church building on the way out, you know, and said, bye, Jesus, see you next week, you know. And too many Christians live that way. It was cute when they did it, of course, but too many Christians live that way. It's like, godly things are there at the church. Bye, I'm not going to take it to go. Bye, Jesus, see you next Sunday, you know. And we wonder why we worry. We wonder why we get so anxious. Could it be that, in some manner of speaking, we left Jesus here at the church and didn't take him to go, didn't pack that truth to go. Paul knew that that kind of thing could happen in his life, in our life, so he says some more here in verse 9. The things that you learned and received and heard and saw in me, look at these two words, these do. Isn't that awesome? And the God of peace will be with you. He doesn't just say, hey, these things you heard, isn't that awesome? You're done. He says, no, you got to go do them, actually. These do. You can never separate right thinking and right attitudes from right action. They naturally flow out. And a lot of times people will have just totally messed up actions and they say, yeah, but, you know, my, but I intended this and they, the rest. And over time, what the Bible teaches is, man, these two will move in alignment. If you get the right attitudes, pretty soon you're going to have the right action. And that choice to rejoice, again, it's not just a choice to have the right mindset but to actually then carry through those things. And so that's what we'll see in the remainder of the chapter. He says in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you indeed lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now what you see here is that part of Paul's joy was that he, even from the prison, could see the tangible actions that were coming out of the church in Philippi. They were growing, they were maturing, and they were living their lives to go. They weren't just having a cool meeting there in Philippi and saying, man, that was awesome. You know, I wonder how Paul's doing. No, they actually were tangibly making a difference in his life, living their lives to go, investing in the work of God through Paul and through others. And, and so he's really sending a thank you letter to them in this, in verse 10. That's what we see. The whole book of Philippians is all about that. He's thanking them for their gift that they gave. And then he teaches what he has learned in the process. Because he says, basically, there was a long time when you guys couldn't have even helped if you wanted to. And he said, it got kind of rough during that time. I mean, that's basically what he's saying. Oh, finally, you know, I got the care package. Thank, thanks a lot. You know, I, I'm really appreciative of it. But he said... I actually learned some stuff when it wasn't there. Some great stuff too. And he says, verse 11 and 12, I've learned. He says it twice. I've learned it. I'm, I, that means it's not natural. It didn't come natural to Paul. It's not going to come natural to us. I learned something. Whatever state I'm in to be content. And this is huge, my friends. Could we say the same? Whatever state you're in here tonight, could you be content? Whatever state? How about the state of Florida? <laughs> National polls. I, I, I read three that just cracked me up. You gotta, uh, sometimes I put these things together and they just make me laugh, so I want to share them with you. National poll. Just read it the other day. USA Today. Miami, in the highest percentage in the nation, okay, we, we topped it out here, on the percentage that you guys, all of us, are spending on our houses. Our houses are the most expensive relative to our income of anyone in the country. Whoa, okay. Hey, we're number one. All right. This one I just read a little while ago. We're the worst drivers. Okay, the very worst in the whole country. They pulled the whole country. Who's the worst? Miami. We're number one. But check this out. This one's good. One more poll. I read this one two weeks ago. Who are the most beautiful people in any city in the, in the country? Miami. Yeah. <laughs> So we're broke, we're bitter, but we're beautiful, baby. So at least one out of three. Now, if that's not enough reason to stay in the state, I don't know what is. But here's the thing, whatever state we're in, you know, it's so easy to get discontent and say, man, what I need to do is move. But here's the problem with that. You're probably going to find that if you were to go talk to people in that state, they're all saying, man, we got to get out of here. You know, I talk to my parents in the winter and they're always like in Colorado. Oh, man, that blizzard. I got to get out of here. It's so cold, you know. 
And then you got California people. Oh, man, we got to get away from the earthquakes. You know, Texas, we came here from Texas and we're like, oh, no, hurricanes. But guess what? Texas gets them, too. Now, I can't go back there anymore. <laughs> Arizona, too dry. Seattle, too wet. You know, here's the thing. Can I give you a little three word thing to think on? Here is here. What do I mean by that? It's always going to be short of heaven here on earth. There is no perfect place here. I've never found the perfect place. I've lived in some very nice places, but I've never found the perfect place. I've never found a place where I could say, I am so content here. Uh, this is, I got no problems no matter what. See, because the perfect peace isn't found in a perfect place. It's found in a perfect person. It's found in Jesus. And that's a lesson that Paul was learning. It's a lesson I'm learning, a lesson you're probably learning. And God may be doing it in different ways in our lives, but here's the thing. God cares a lot more about who I am than where I am. You know, we have a saying around the church and you just have to listen to the inflection, but they say, well, it doesn't matter where you're at. What matters is where you're at. You know what they're saying? It's, it doesn't matter physically where you are located. What matters is where you are spiritually. That's what's going to matter most. See, who I am, my attitudes, my character, well, that's what really matters to God. Where I am, the outward circumstances, well, he'll vary those all over the map to try to get me to be who I need to be. See, God will sometimes abase me, and sometimes he has abounded me, and both of those are tests. You know, when you think about it, he wants to teach us to live our lives to go. That's what he really wants us to do, not for here. And generally, we think, look, you know, if I were here or there or this or that, I would be content. So single people, this is what they think. Man, if I were married, I'd be content. Can I uh, get you to talk with some married people who think if they were single, they would be content? <laughs> See, here's the thing. Kids want to be older, right? Older people want to be kids again. We all somehow fall for the lie that contentment is found somewhere else around the corner. But this is the thing. Contentment has a lot more to do with who we are than where we are. And where we are, God is trying to teach us to be content. And right now, there are miserable people in Hawaii. And some of you are saying, well, I want to be one of them, you know? <laughs> well, that's the thing. There are miserable people everywhere. I saw that at Disney World when we went once. I just saw, I looked around and I was fascinated while I'm sitting there, you know, eating my $14 hamburger or whatever. <laughs> and I, but I was watching these kids who, who, they were just miserable. And they weren't ours. Ours were doing all right, you know, but... But families fighting at Disney World. And I was like, man, that's pretty amazing. Think of it, the happiest place on earth. <laughs> the happiest place on earth. That's it. And, you can, you know, and there you are yelling at each other and saying, we're going to go home right now. You know? <laughs> and Paul learned a lesson there in the prison, you know, which was not the happiest place on earth. Which is that it's possible to be happy here on earth when you live your life to go. See, that's the thing. Around, uh, he could abound, he could be a base. What is he saying? He's saying, I guess I've stayed at the Jerusalem Ritz Carlton, but here I am at the Roach Motel. You know, that's the place where Lynn and I got the free place to, the Roach Motel. <laughs> but it's not where I am. It's about who I am and whose I am. That's really what's going to make a difference in my life. And so some of you say, well, you know, I've learned one half of the lesson. I've learned how to be abased, you know, so let's work on abound. Let's work on that lesson, Lord. And you know what? I've seen this happen. I, I think abounding actually is a tougher test in many ways than being abased. What does being abased mean? It means lacking things, not having enough. Abounding is when you got way too much. And I have found more people lose, really, their spiritual compass when they abound than when they're abased. You know, I've seen uh, persecution rarely shipwreck a person's life, but I've certainly seen prosperity shipwreck a Christian's life because it makes it so easy to start living your life for here. Oh, man, it's all about here. I don't want to go to heaven yet, man. I'm having a great time here. I got it all figured out. And so... You see there in verse 13 what Paul is sharing with us. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, one of the things I love in Bible teaching, the way we do where we go verse by verse, is that you get to see these famous verses, you know, the celebrity verses. This is a celebrity verse. You know, some, some are famous, and this is a famous verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But that one, what's its context? What's its full context of this victory verse here? It's that of contentment. Where, you know, a lot of times you see it in a, a prosperity context. And yet you see Paul saying, man, I, I was sitting in a prison. I didn't have anything. But I learned in that I can, I can make it through that with Christ. Through Christ, I can live my life to go no matter what I'm going through. That's what he 
showed here. And then verse 14, he says, Nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians also know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. And he says in verse 17, Not that I seek the gift, I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So here, again, Philippians, a thank you note. Paul is saying, Philippians, you guys came through time and time again. Even when everyone else had forgotten Paul who, you know, you guys were still thinking about me. And he says, I do appreciate that. And he said, I thank you for the gift, but the greatest gift you gave me wasn't the stuff. It was the, the realization that, man, something real is taking place in their lives. Because when a person's thinking about other people, that's when Jesus has really taken hold of a heart. See, it's not just once, but consistently. It wasn't just that he's, they said, oh yeah, that Paul, well, didn't we already do something for him? Uh, I don't care about him anymore. See, when they were asked, hey, is your life for here to go? The Philippians answered loud and clear, it's to go. Eternal investments, people, the same investment that God makes, the work of God. And they knew, hey, I can't take it with me. I might as well send it to Paul. And so notice the point Paul makes in verse 17. He says, I'm excited for the fruit in your account. Now, of course, Paul was a person. He was excited about the gift. You know, if he got a fruit basket or whatever, or some cookies, chocolate chip cookies, that's what I would have wanted in prison, you know. I'm sure, with a little nail file in them, <laughs> hopefully. But, but he'd say, man, that could certainly make prison time fly by, right? You'd be like, oh, thank you for the gift. But he's more excited, really, about what it meant for them than what it meant for him. Again, their generosity evidence of a to-go kind of life. And he says, it's there in your account. It's not here. <laughs> the, you know, I, it didn't do much for you here, maybe. But it's going to do a lot for you in heaven. And I love God's accounting system. It's an amazing thing. He's a great record keeper. Uh, on, on one sense, he's a terrible record keeper. He keeps no record of wrongs. The Bible says love keeps no record of wrongs. I love that about God. He's so forgetful. It says that he looks up under the sin column in my life and goes, we seem to have lost the records. Oh, all right. But then what's amazing is he never loses the record of our service. Isn't that amazing? He loses all the record of our sin and never loses one scrap of paper that has to do with our service. He forgets our sin. He remembers our service. What a deal. And you think about what they're saying here. Godly giving does way more for the giver even than the receiver. And so Paul is excited about them there. And if you give to this ministry, I want you to know you do have fruit to your account. You should think about that and rejoice in it. Because a lot of you, I look around, a lot of you give time and talent and treasures, you know, your heart into this place. And when people get saved, as they do here, it's such an amazing thing. You can think, hey, that's more in the fruit basket, you know. <laughs> this is a fruit-filled church in the right sense. And so... We are on the radio literally all over the country, all kinds of different things, supportive missionaries and all that. And it's just a, a reminder that this room, yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of folks in here. But you know what? There's a lot more folks out there. And the bottom line is the message isn't just for here. It's to go, and, and God is getting it out through you. And so that's fruit to your account. And he says, indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full. Having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I love what Paul says here. He says, I'm full. <laughs> now, you don't need to send any more cookies. You know, I, I actually got enough here. No needs. I'm stuffed. And I love this because he says, I know something else too, which is God's going to supply all your needs. Now, it doesn't say all your greeds. It says all your needs. But it's really important to see that God's promises here are to generous givers. You know, generous givers will be joyful livers. And that's the very reason that, that God gives these promises. He says, you know what? It's a weird thing in God's economy. I don't even know how it works. I took a lot of finance classes back in school, and I didn't learn this principle there. I learned it when I came to Christ. But the bottom line is this. God somehow manages to have a life that gives, actually receives too. You know, in ways that are far more even than just the money. Just, but I, I've never seen somebody over the long haul lose for being a generous person. 
And so as we think about some things coming up, I will be teaching the Money Matters Seminar. I know this is a tough economic time, and I do want to try as much as I can to help people in that area. Why? Because I, what I found is most people are willing and wanting to do more than they, they feel like they're able to. And so often what I've found is that people can not only give more, but live more if they simply put some of these principles into pra practice. So again, Paul didn't want something for, from them. He wanted something for them. And that's our heart here too. We want fruit to your account because we uh, don't want anybody getting to heaven and, and not having their own fruit basket. You know what I mean? And so verse 20, he says, Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now that's the end of the passage here, but I just want to think on one thought with you that kind of ties the first chapter together with the last chapter, which is that Paul talks about being chained to Caesar's guard, you know. And here at the very end of the book, he says in verse 22, hey, Caesar's household says howdy, you know, says hi, hi y'all. And so the funny thing about that is Caesar was a pagan ruler. I mean, you know, we're talking the, the, the guys that Paul should have been saying, pray that Caesar will, you know, get a salad dressing named after him after they chop him up or whatever. But... Instead, he took advantage of this tough situation of being in the prison. And his household, Caesar's household, as they're chained to Paul, they're getting this gospel, they're getting this overflowing, abundant joy out of Paul's life. And they're like, man, I haven't found that in Caesar's house. I haven't found that in the here. I sure, you know, in many ways, they would have had a nice government gig. And yet they were saying, man, I don't like it. <laughs> Say hi for us. Tell the Philippians howdy and thanks for sending Paul to the prison here. And it's those who had come to faith as the result of their contact with him. Extreme joy. Which means, you know what? The whole thing is, when our lives change, our changed lives change lives. Isn't that awesome? That's what God really wants to do. He wants us to have extreme joy through extreme circumstances that people look on and say, man, you're living different than I am. I, I mean, look at your here and now. It ain't so great sometimes. And they say, yeah, but that's because I'm not living for here. I'm living for there and then. I'm living to go. And I'd love you to go with me. <laughs> I'd love you to go with me. And so here's the question, you know, as we get ready to go here tonight into our world, into our homes, into our schools and our workplaces, here's the question. Ask yourself the question, am I living for here or am I living to go? What's my priority? I pray we could all, everyone in this room, be able to answer, I'm living to go and I'm aiming to take as many people to go with me as I possibly can. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this book. It's an amazing book, Lord. There's truth that could be chewed on for the rest of our lives and really all into eternity here. And Lord, I know that every believer in this room would be challenged because I know I get challenged by this book, Lord. It's just every time I read it, and I've read it many times, but every time I read it, I realize... Uh, that I have not yet apprehended. But I, one thing I want to do, I want to press on to the goal of the upward call that you have for me. But Lord, even more than that, my heart goes out to anyone here tonight who maybe doesn't have the assurance of a to-go kind of life, a, a life that they know where they would be going and they know what they would be doing after their, after their life here is over. And so, God, I pray that you would use this time that we have here to draw near to you anybody who still has a question mark over their eternity. Lord, I pray that you would use this time to draw them near to you. And so with our heads still bowed, with our eyes closed, I, I just want to ask the crucial question one more time in a little different way, which is, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go when you leave here? Now, some of you are saying, Pastor, I'm hungry after the talking of the Happy Meal and all that. I'm going over to Mickey D's or I'm going to BK or I'm going to KFC or I'm going to get some Pollo Tropical or whatever. I'm not talking about where you're going after church. I'm talking about where you're going after life, after death. Where, where are you going to go? And the thing is, after, after this life, that's when life really begins. I mean, this is just a very small drop in all of eternity. And if you want to go to heaven, we talked about heaven tonight, and so many people take that for granted. Isn't that where everybody goes? No, if you want to go to heaven, you've got to come to Christ. 
And the question is here tonight, have you done that? Have you done that? I'm not talking about just coming to church. I'm talking about coming to Christ, making a decision that you're going to be a follower of his. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. And the meaning of life is found in that relationship with him. And without Christ, you're just existing. And we sang it tonight, that mercy and justice meet on the cross. You know, our sin, it separates us from God. So many people experience so much less out of life than they thought they would. And they'll chase some momentary pleasure saying, this is going to bring it, and all it brings is heartache. And that sin separates us from God, but God has done everything that could possibly be done to bridge that gap. He sent his son to pay for our sin. He died the death that we deserve. He rose again to prove his claims. The only thing left to do is believe. And that's something I can't do for you. It's something your parents can't do for you. It's something your family members can't do for you. If I could, I would do it for you. It's something you have to do. He gives us the choice, but he won't force us. And so tonight, again, that question, is your life being lived for here or is it going to be lived to go? Do you know where you would go if you were to die tonight? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus here tonight, there's something I know about you, even if I don't know you, which is I know that you're empty. (laughs) I know that you're guilty. I know that you're discontent. I know that you're anxious. I know that your human relationships have been full of friction and everything else. How do I know that? Well, because it's the human condition. It is the way things are. Every one of us know it. We've all experienced it. We all fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible says that we were created subject to vanity, which means, you know what? All our best efforts aren't going to fill and fulfill our lives. Only God can fulfill our lives. Why would God create us subject to emptiness? Because he wanted to fill us. That's the reason. He, he wanted us to, to, to feel that sense so we would ask the big questions of life and not just think it's all about here and realize, man, here isn't all that. There's got to be something more. And the Bible says that there is, that God has promised us eternal and abundant life, but that's only found in Jesus. Now, you might be saying here tonight, I need that, you know. Maybe you grew up in a religious system and you know right away, hey, that is not going to bring you extreme joy. Sometimes it just adds to the guilt. What is it? It's a relationship with Jesus. And that's what God offers you here tonight. You may say, man, I want to do that. I don't know how to do it. I, I, I believe in God, but I, I don't know how to go beyond that thing. Some people seem to have something I don't have. Maybe it's what they have is a real vital relationship with Jesus as Lord, as Savior, that they've opened their heart and life to him and follow after him. And that's the opportunity we give you here tonight. All I'm going to ask you to do is with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand in your seat wherever you are if you're saying, hey, I want my sin forgiven. I, I, I want my guilt gone. I want to know that if I were to die today, I'm going to go to heaven. My life isn't just for here. Even after this is all over, I know where I'm going to go. That's going to give you purpose and peace and joy in this life that you're not going to find any other place. You could keep looking, but why? I can tell you, everybody who has found the answer in Christ has one regret, and they say it over and over again. The only regret they have is that they waited so long. So don't wait any longer than tonight. Tonight is the night of salvation. The Bible says today is the day that we have. Now is the moment that we have. So if that's you that I'm talking to and you want to acknowledge your need for Jesus, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that we've had here to rejoice in who you are. And Lord, our greatest need, again, is just to take these things and put them into practice. Lord, Lord, there are people in our workplaces, there are people that we will come into contact with tomorrow who do not have what we have, what we enjoy, what you have given to us. Lord, you've given it to us freely, but God, our, our need is just to go out there and make a difference in the world. And we know we can't do that apart from you. So God, I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that Philippians would be lived and breathed through our lives. And I thank you for this opportunity to share these words with your people. In Jesus' name, amen.